ู่เซสชันสุดท้ายแล้วค่ะขออนุญาตแนะนําสปิเกอร์ท่านสุดท้ายนะคะขออนุญาตแนะนำในภาษาอังกฤษก่อนนะคะเพราะว่าท่าน professor Gary Wong นะคะท่านมาจาก um, Chinese University of Hong Kong นะคะ Department of Pediatrics นะคะ We have a special lecture นะคะ uh, He is the immediate past president of Asia Pacific Academy of Pediatric Allergy and one of the board directors of Gina Professor Gary has extensive experience in many editorial boards of academic journals. Currently, he is also an associate associate editor of New England Journal Medicine. Professor Gary will be talking about severe asthma, current diagnostic, and therapeutic strategy. Uh, thank you, Professor Gary. We're very honored to have you here. Now the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. To discuss with you this very important topic, severe asthma, current diagnostic and therapeutic strategies. I'm Gary Wong from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Well, when we discuss about what severe asthma is all about, we have to uh, look at this problem uh, according to this definition defined by the ERS and ATS task force uh, some years ago with the lead uh, investigator of this group being Professor Chong from Imperial College. And uh, severe asthma is defined as asthma which requires treatment with high dose inhaled corticosteroid plus a second controller with or without the use of systemic steroid to prevent it from becoming uncontrolled or which remain uncontrolled despite this therapy. And it has been estimated around 5 to 10 percent of all asthmatics belong to this group of severity. Happens more often in adults than in children. And as we know, these patients consume a majority of the healthcare resources for asthmatics. Well, how do we define high dose inhaled corticosteroid? So, if we look at whether it's children under 12 years of age or adolescents and adults over 12, here I list out the dosage of different preparation of inhaled corticosteroid that are considered as high dose. So, for example, if one look at the threshold of uh, budesonide, it's 800 uh, microgram or above for children and over 1600 microgram per day for uh, adolescents and adults. Now, how exactly do we assess a patient with severe asthma? So if we encounter a patient said to have asthma and on very high dose of treatment with inhaled corticosteroid plus a possibly another controller and still have a lot of symptoms. We must ask ourselves, are we really dealing with asthma or something else is going on? We've also asked the question that have we optimized the current existing asthma treatment for this particular patient? Is the patient using the inhalers correctly? Is the patient adhering to the prescribed treatment? Could there be any comorbidities that makes the asthma very difficult to control? Then, if we are very sure about the diagnosis of asthma and we have already optimized the existing treatment and assessed the various comorbidities. Then we'll proceed on to determine the phenotype of this asthma and then devise a treatment plan and possibly investigate the patient to determine the type of phenotypes. One must remember whether it is children or adults. Well, the so-called poor asthma or severe asthma very often in our practice with proper history and investigation, they turn out to be not 
asthma, and that's why they did not respond to asthma treatment appropriately. For example, I list out here the possible conditions in children and in adults which may mimic severe asthma. In children, of course, we'll see more congenital disorders or immunodeficiency, which would give the children a lot of respiratory symptoms. While in adults, there are other specific conditions such as pulmonary embolism, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, Church-Strauss syndrome, all these may give the patient symptoms mimicking asthma. And if one is very happy with the fact that the diagnosis is correct, so we may want to do the uh, following investigations. So what exactly are the purposes of the investigations? And of course, some of these investigations help us to reconfirm the diagnosis of asthma. It also determine, help us to determine whether the patient responds to steroids or not. These investigations also help us to determine whether there are comorbid conditions that are not properly looked after, and they also help us to assess the phenotype of asthma. Well, earlier we mentioned about comorbid conditions. Here I list out the various comorbid conditions or some conditions which may make the asthma very difficult to control. For example, people with poorly controlled rhinosinusitis, obesity, the patient continue to be exposed to cigarette smoke, either first hand or second hand, or they may be psychological factors, including hyperventilation, which may appear to make the asthma poorly controlled. And of course, there is a very small percentage of patients, particularly related to those patients with obesity, that they have gastroesophageal reflux. And there are also specific drugs, such as ACE inhibitor, which may give the patient a lot of respiratory symptoms. And if one looks carefully at the pathology of the airways and try to determine what are the possible underlying types or underlying phenotypes of asthma, one would be able to find out there are actually various different subtypes. On one side, on our left, we have the type of asthma associated with eosinophilia, while on the other side, we have asthma either without eosinophils or associated with a lot of neutrophilic inflammation. And on the side of eosinophilic asthma, obviously, particularly with those early onset type of asthma, very often is associated with a lot of atopy and a very high level of IgE. More in the older patients, we can have eosinophilic asthma without a lot of so-called atopy or high IgE. But eosinophils tend to be high and the type 2 uh, cytokines tend to be elevated in these individuals. Now, this may be too simplistic. In real life, very often, these so-called TH2 dominant or high IgE type, they may overlap with patients with the high T2 high with a borderline or on the low side of IgE. And there are also patients with a predominant type of neutrophils. So what we call neutrophilic asthma or TH2 low type of severe asthma. Now, of course, these things are crucial for our subsequent management of these patients. But one must remember, you know, the phenotype of asthma 
do changes with time. And severe asthma, after a follow-up period of a few years, sometimes the phenotype change from the severe asthma to the not so severe type of asthma. This is particularly true in pediatric population. I'll bring you to a recent study which uh, belonged to the SOBS, a severe asthma uh, study group in the United States. And this uh, study paid attention particular to the pediatric population. In this study, there were a total of 188 subjects classified uh, potentially may be with the severe asthma phenotype. And among them, there were 71 girls and 117 boys. And on assessment, their average age is around 11.8 to 11.3 years. Now, according to the ATS and YARES criteria for severe asthma, they fit into these categories with a very low ACT score. They are on high dose ICS plus a second controller, mostly LABA, and they have more than two exacerbations in the last year. And in addition, their FU1 tends to be low, less than 80% predicted. And among these patients, 110 at baseline were determined as severe asthma while the other 77 at baseline was classified as not severe. And these patients were assessed consecutively over the next 36 months. And as you can see here, gradually among these patients, actually about 40% of the patient initially classified as severe asthma. Gradually, after three years, they became under control and did not satisfy the classification as severe asthma. And one would be curious to ask, you know, what would be the factors that predict improvement from severe asthma to not severe asthma? Interestingly, uh, race, the initial baseline lung function, the gender, now, you know, we tend to think boys tend to get better, while girls tend to get worse through, you know, when they uh, get into the adolescent age group. But in this study, the gender, you know, the baseline allergic sensation, they do not predict improvement. However, actually, a high eosinophil count you know, greater than 436 cells per microliter actually has a positive association with subsequent improvement. So in other words, the higher initial eosinophil count in severe asthma at a young age actually tends to predict improvement with time. As we discussed earlier, in terms of the so-called severe asthma phenotype, in order to help us to classify them and to find the most appropriate personalized based treatment, we do the following assessments. We measure the exhaled nitric oxide. We assess the blood eosinophil count. If possible, in your lab, if you can do induced sputum, we can look at the induced sputum as whether to see whether it's predominant eosinophilic type or neutrophilic type or mix. And then if there's a suggestion of possible past infection in bronchiectasis resulting in symptoms, the high resolution CT will help us. The lung function, of course, you know, we, we can determine there is obstruction as well as reversibility. We're pretty happy with the diagnosis. But if we see very severe fixed obstruction without any reversibility, we really want to question the diagnosis of asthma. Furthermore, some years ago, you know, uh, in England, when there was a study looking at the severe asthmatic in children admitted to the ICU, they tend to have food allergies to assessment 
of their allergic potential are also important in the so-called severe asthma phenotype. And if we look at this diagnostic uh, tree of flowchart for the assessment of severe asthma in adults and adolescents proposed by Sally Vansell a couple of years ago. Now let me walk you through this uh, complicated diagram. So once we are happy with the diagnosis of asthma and we have assessed the comorbidities and risk factor, we we'll first step we look at the lung function to see the degree of obstruction. And in general, the severe asthmatic in adults and adolescents, we may see FEV1 less than 8% predicted. The second we, uh, aspect, we would like to determine whether there is any bronchial uh, reversibility with this airway obstruction. And with the asthma diagnosis, we hope to see there is some degree of reversibility. Third, one that is determined, we would like to determine the type of inflammations happening in this particular patient by measuring the exhaled nitric oxide level as well as the blood eosinophil count. So if there is obstruction with reversibility, and the FENO is high, and so is blood eosinophils. That would fall into the category of TH2 high or T2 high type of asthma. But if we find that there is fixed obstruction with no reversibility, and very low FENO and low eosinophil, we may uh, back on uh, the diagnostic tree that this may not be asthma, and in particular, in patients with a heavy smoking history, this is more likely to be a case of COPD rather than asthma. And on the other hand, if there is uh, no obstruction or no reversibility with low exhaled nitric oxide and low eosinophils, it is very likely this is not asthma and we would need to consider the symptoms are related to other functional disorder such as the vocal cord dysfunction, anxiety, or obesity related syndrome. Well, for those patients that we are pretty happy with the diagnosis of severe asthma, and in particular, you know, when the allergic markers or T2 markers, such as ENO and eosinophil, if they were on the low side, then this group of asthma it's a bit more difficult to control because the current treatment strategies for severe asthma, the majority of the treatments are targeted against TH2 type of inflammation. So we we'll discuss more in detail later on. In this group of T2 low asthma, we have relatively few treatment. Currently, we have the uh, long anti-muscularinic uh, agents or thermoplasty. While for severe asthma with high yeno and high eosinophils, now we tend to see a group that is early onset. For example, you know, less than 18 years of age. In general, this group tends to have a higher IgE. And in this group of patients, we would first choose anti-IgE as the biologic treatment. While for the, those patients tend to be adult onset, and maybe there is a particular phenotype associated with rhinosinusitis and nasal polyp and eosinophilia, this group will respond to, would tend to respond to TH2 type of cytokine blockers. And there are a few of them we can discuss subsequently. 
Well, of course, this group of severe asthmatic, it's not one specific phenotype. You know, some years ago, when the, uh, one of the deputy editors in the New England Journal of Medicine wrote about what is the definition of precision medicine. Well, precision medicine would be treatment targeted specifically to the needs of the individual patient on the basis of various measurements, including genetic, biomarker, phenotypic, or even psychosocial characteristic that distinguish a given patient from the other ones so that we can use specific treatment and at the same time with the goal of minimizing unnecessary side effects. In fact, you know, when uh, the ex-president of the United States, uh, Pr President Obama, back then in 2015, um, he initiated a project, the so-called the Precision Medicine Initiative, to specifically address this particular question. And there have been a few large groups in North America and in Europe. In, in Europe, you have the Anfumosa uh, study group, as well as the UBioPAP group. And in the state, with the SARP group, the Severe Asthma Research Program group, looking at this particular group of patients, trying to tease out the characteristic, trying to figure out what exactly are the underlying reason for the severe asthma phenotype. And with the work of these groups of researchers, basically, asthma can be divided in this group of severe asthma can be divided into five different phenotypes. The first one is the allergic asthma group, but very often with a childhood onset. The second group, there is the severe allergic group. Again, these to be childhood onset. The third group tend to have uh, adult or middle age onset with high degree of eosinophilia associated with sinusitis. And there is an also an adult phenotype tend to be associated with systemic steroid dependent. While there is a late onset group tends to be associated with obesity and usually start in teenage years. Now, these are the clinical characteristics that we can see, but what about the exact underlying mechanism when we look at the airway and evaluate the type of inflammation? And here we see the very, well, the very first one developed was anti-IL-5 mepolizumab. It was the key cytokine for eosinophil differentiation, recruitment, activation, and survival. And the first study was published many years ago, you know, 2007 in the Blue Journal. And at that time, the patient was just selected by clinical criteria alone. There were more than 350 patients, 18 to 55 years of age, with a low FEV1, 50 to 80, and patients uh, on high dose inhaled corticosteroid, but still remain symptomatic. So these patients were randomized into two groups, the treatment group down here and the placebo group. Now, as you can see here, if one look at the blood eosinophil counts, it's highly effective, the two doses, either the 250 milligram or 750 milligram. But when one look at the uh, sputum eosinophil, same thing here. Here is the placebo group, the sputum, the baseline, and after 12 weeks, also highly effective in reducing sputum eosinophils. But overall, when they look at the results of the morning uh, peak expiry uh, flow rate, there was no improvement with treatment of either the, do the two dosage of mepolizumab. Rather disappointing. But after, uh, and also uh, when one look at the uh, asthma uh, symptom score, again, we do not any see any improvement. 
But, you know, after about uh, eight years, another clinical trial was performed on mepolizumab and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, this time, the investigators specifically asked, since anti-IL-5 particular target at IL-5, which is a very important TH2 mediator, what if we select patient that give us an impression that their inflammation is primarily eosinophilic in nature? So here, they pick patient. They have to have at least one measurements of the eosinophil in the past year before recruitment into the trial. And the eosinophil count has to be more than 300 cells per microliter. Here, a Baker trial, they recruit close to 600 patients, 12 to 82 years of age again, with a low FEV1 and at least two exacerbations in the past year requiring the use of systemic steroid and they are receiving at least 880 microgram of fruticasone or equivalent on a daily basis and still have symptoms. Here, as you can see, there is no dramatic improvement in the FEV1. Now, this is a much bigger trial. They are able, and also longer trial, for throughout uh, 32 weeks of the treatment period. As you can see here, the use of the two doses of subcutaneous of the mepolizumab, whether it's 75 or 100, you can see here, actually compared to the placebo, there is about a 50% reduction in the exacerbation rate. So meaning, you know, when we use these biologics, we have to target it as specific group of patients, telling us that the underlying inflammation is primarily driven by the TH2 type of inflammation. Well, since the first one, uh, these anti-cytokine has developed. And of course, you know, anti-IgE has been around for decades and has been proven to be effective in uh, allergic, atopic type of uh, severe asthma. And over the past decade, uh, I've listed here uh, four uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies directed against TH2 inflammation, whether it's mepolizumab or resilizumab, which is against anti-IL-5, while benralizumab is the anti-IL-5 receptor antibody while dupilumab is uh, uh, an antibody against the common uh, receptor of the IL-4, uh, IL-13 component of the receptor. And in particular, dupilumab has been uh, documented in clinical trial to be highly effective against both asthma as well as eczema. Well, what's coming in the pipeline? There is um, two directed uh, component against two alarmants, the TSLP and the IL-33 with tisipilumab most likely coming onto the market uh, with approval soon. Now these are in particular very important. These are not specifically targeted. TH2 is targeted at the alarmant at a very high level. So these would be potentially useful for T2 low type of uh, as severe asthma. And there are also uh, brondalumab currently investigated in various clinical trials, which is an anti-IL-17 uh, antibody. And there was also liberkisumab, anti-IL-13, but unfortunately, the clinical trials did not show significant improvement uh, with treatment anti-IL-13. So this was uh, the company decided to stop the anti-IL-13 program. Well, when we do use these uh, antibodies, what exactly are we trying to achieve? You know, what do we want from these biologic treatments? Well, of course, we would like these treatments to improve lung function of the patient, 
we hope with treatment we'll be able to reduce systemic steroid intake and hence reduce side effects. And of course, we would like the treatment to improve asthma control. We would also like not only evidence from our CT or randomized control trial, we would also like to see data from real world effectiveness study because RCT tends to recruit a very specific subgroup of patients that may not be truly representative of what we see in the market or in our clinic. Well, if one look at the various studies that have been published related to use of mepolizumab, bandrolizumab, rizolizumab, that one can see uh, overall improved lung function of around 250 milliliters. And also, when one assess the steroid intake, clinical trials have demonstrated that use of these biologic can result in an average reduction in terms of a steroid per day at around 4 to 8 milligram per day. Furthermore, there are also uh, eight trials looking at mepolizumab and four trials looking at bandrolizumab in the assessment of the asthma control test score. And both drugs have been demonstrated to uh, cause an improvement, result in an improvement of the ACT score by around six points. Well, what about comparison of the results of RCT versus the real life effectiveness score study? Well, first of all, uh, among these things, I think clinicians have a very difficult time in terms of choosing what type of biologics to use because there has not been any head to head comparisons among these biologics. And also, the predictor of responders are rather crude. Basically, we relied on whether FENO was elevated and whether eosinophil count was elevated. And one has to be very careful because these severe asthmatic, very often they are on steroid and steroid tend to push the eosinophil count down. Since there are no good predictors, and also we do not know whether the patient may respond uh, well to one biologic over the other biologic, we still need to carry out therapeutic trial on the individual patient to test whether a particular patient would respond to a particular type of biologic. Perhaps the most difficult question to answer is the fact that, you know, when can we stop treatment for a particular patient? And none of the clinical trials to date have given us ideas of when we can stop the treatment and whether there are any potential long-term uh, modulating effect in resulting in improvement in every inflammation over time. As I said earlier, you know, uh, there has been one very good review just published in the Clinical Experimental Allergy, reviewing, comparing the real-life uh, effectiveness uh, study versus the RTCT study, and basically very similar both the real world study as well as RCT demonstrate you know, improvement in the exacerbation rates. And it's interesting that to see that almost all the trials demonstrate approximately 50% reduction in the exacerbation rate compared to the placebo group. And in terms of lung function improvement, I've uh, listed out here from the recent review in terms of the improvement. You can see here whether it's the use of mepolizumab or banralizumab or resolizumab, the improvement is approximately two to three hundred milliliters of FDB1. Well, this is 
uh, the treatment for T2 high type of severe asthma. Well, what about the T2 low type of asthma? Very difficult. We have very little options. You know, uh, there have been a couple of trials looking at the addition of the llama, the anticholinergic agents, or the use of cefromycin. Although um, this looks a little bit depressing, on the horizon, actually, there are many new drugs coming, including the two anti-alarmants, and looks like anti-TSLP will soon be entering the market. And there are monoclonal antibodies against IL-1 beta, against IL-17, against IL-6 tocilizumab, and against IL-23. Now, some of these drugs have been licensed for treatment of other conditions, such as juvenile chronic arthritis. And uh, so hopefully more clinical trials and real life data will be available for the use of these uh, biologic, in particular for T2 low type of severe asthma. And the use of cefromycin basically was demonstrated in this large RCT by Peter Gibson, published in The Lancet some years ago. It was a 48-week randomized control trial, recruited 420 adult asthmatic. And these were asthmatic, not controlled despite high dose ICS plus LABA. And in the treatment group, patients were randomized to receive 500 mg of cefromycin three times a week. And if one look at the results, you can see uh, with the treatment, there is reduction of the exacerbation rates by about 40% in this one year study. And if one look at the annualized uh, asthma exacerbation rate, you can see in the placebo group, it's around 2, while in the treatment group, it's about 1.2. And uh, now this, that's why in many of the guidelines, and just particularly in patients with poorly controlled asthma, particularly related to those with T2 low, one can give them a therapeutic trial of azithromycin. But such long-term use of antibiotic, one always have to worry about the potential induction of resistant organism. So in summary, you know, this is the current personalized approach for severe asthma. So the first step, when we see a severe, so-called severe asthma, we have to review the history and reviewed investigations, make sure we're dealing with asthma. Then we divided them into either the T2 high type or T2 low group. We have more drugs available for treating the T2 high group. So depending on whether they have high level of A to B with high IgE, one would consider to use an anti-IgE. Well, the non-atopic, but T2 high type, we tend to use the anti-IL-4, anti-IL-5, and anti-IL-413 receptor strategies. And in particular, if the patient happens to have both severe asthma and an eczema, dupilumab would be a good choice. While there are fewer options for Th2 uh, low type of asthma, in which we have, you know, the long-acting muscarinic agent, thermoplasty, and a therapeutic trial of macrolides. And that's why when we look at the recent version of the GINA guideline, and basically in this group of severe asthma, we're dealing with the step five patient. And usually these patients have been on high dose ICS plus LAMA plus LABA. And if they still not well controlled, we would need to consider the biologics that we have discussed. 
So over the past 100 years, we have come a long way, in particular in the last 10 years, there is a plethora of biologics coming into the market. What we really don't know though, we still do not know how to select these biologics for a particular patient. And of course, severe asthma also happens in different age groups, and in particular, in the very young child, we still have very few drugs that can be used for this type of severe asthma. So in conclusion, the approach to severe asthma is we must demand better care for our patient. There are room for improvement at all levels of severity. For those with severe asthma, depending on the TH2 high or TH2 low, now we have a variety of medications that can be used, and we must treat the comorbid conditions. The limitations are there are very few biomarkers that help us to predict response. And despite the million dollars spent in genetic study, there is still no good genetic marker to predict response. And also, before considering all these treatments, we must optimize the current treatment, the ICS dosage, the technique, the adherence, as well as assessment of comorbid and environmental conditions. And I thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. For the insightful some echo thing. from the phone. <laughs> yes, I can see that. Thank you very I mean, much. You, you, have, it, yeah, you give a very clear push how to handle patients with severe asthma. Now we have some questions from the floor from Dr. Pagit. Here is the first question. Do you think the asthma is more severe in Caucasian compared to Asian population? Yeah, it, it's a very interesting question. And uh, I, I happen to have the experience working in both in Canada and sometime in London and also in Germany. And I have to say my impression is that, you know, overall, we do seem to see more the severe type of asthma in the Caucasian population. Mm -hmm. but, but to determine what causes it, it's a bit more difficult because there are a variety of factors you know, first of all, is the adherence to medication. And I'm, I must say a lot of Asian population, they tend to listen to the doctor a little bit more. And the second thing is environment. And I must say in the place that I work in Canada and also in uh, London, at that time, I still remember when we were doing a research project, assessing these asthmatic and also assessed lung function in uh, cystic fibrosis children. And I was shocked, you know, when I take the history from them, 30 to 40% of these families are exposed to cigarette smoke. Okay, that is a lot lower in our population too. And uh, having said that, you know, all these factors probably play important roles, but I find in the Asia population though, we tend to be exposed to higher level of environmental pollution, for example, related to traffic. And sometimes also indoor air pollution too. Mm -hmm. And to add the third complexity to assessment of severity is the different type of allergen loads also vary from places to places. In general, in Asian homes, we see a very high level of dust mites and many of our asthmatics are highly sensitized to dust mites. But all in all, when you combine all these factors, I still find the more severe asthmatics in the Caucasians. That's why in the literature, they always quote around five to 10%. And I must say in my practice, it's more like 1% or so. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. And it would be interesting to tease out, you know, what were the factors responsible for such differences in terms of their severity? Mm -hmm. yeah. But we're lucky, we see less severe asthma, smaller population requiring the biologics. Despite all the pollution and all, but we seem to have more adherence and different cultural background and all. That's right, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the next that's... question is, how low could we allow FEV1 to be in this 
severe asthma? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. You know, when we assess severe asthma, you know, now in general, you would find the FEV1 will be lower than 80. But this sort of thing only applied to adolescent and adult patient with asthma. You know, a lot of younger asthmatics, the younger they are, actually, they can have a lot of symptoms. They can have a lot of attacks when they're exposed to viral infections or, for example, rhinovirus infection. And in between these severe attacks, the lung function could be relatively normal. So we have to be careful about this. You know, in, in fact, in the younger asthmatics, rarely do you see a very, very low FEV1. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and I must say, there should not be a number that we say, oh, okay, we allowed it to be, you know, around 85 or 90, because it's a total package of control. You know, lung function is just one of them. Symptoms is another one. And the other biomarkers we measure, for example, the exhaled nitric oxide and the eosinophil and, and also the quality of life as assessed by our history. So a combination of all those things would be important for us to make a decision when we adjust the medication up and when we need to add additional controller or yeah. biologics. So it's not just a number. Mm -hmm. Not just a number that have to consider the other factor uh, as well. That's Same right, the whole package. package. The whole package. That's right. And mm -hmm. That's bring me to another question. Why could we maintain uh, severe asthma with high dose of ICS, like in the past? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, in the past when there are no options, we continue to do this. The problem is, you know, with a variety of, particularly the newer type of inhaled corticosteroid, you know, even though, you know, we say it's kind of locally act in the airway. And in fact, you know, the fluticasone group of drugs initially were marketed as, oh, it's, you know, it's only act in the airways and it's poorly absorbed through the GI tract. But the fact is we know actually a fair percentage of the drug is absorbed through the respiratory tract. And that also has significant long-term side effects, you know, if the dose is just very high for a prolonged period of time. So in general, once we reach that sort of level, we would like to bring down the dosage as much as possible so as to minimize systemic absorption and the subsequent systemic side effects. And a, a variety of studies, particularly those from the real life study from David Price have clearly demonstrated uh, that you know, if you use a very high dose of a steroid, particularly very often these patients, remember, they will have periodic attacks. And whenever they have attacks, you need to give them a course of systemic steroid. And mm -hmm. all these would add up to increase the other type of morbidities in these asthmatic. You know, for example, those who are exposed to high dose steroid and repeated bursts of corticosteroid, they have a high prevalence of diabetes. They have a lower uh, bone density. So all these things would add up. So we must try our best to, if possible, minimize the dosage of particular, we need to get rid of the systemic steroid as much as possible, and then reduce the inhaled steroid down to the you know, moderate dosage range. Mm. Okay, ha. so that's the last question. As the biggest question that you mentioned in your slide, million dollar question, I would like to ask both Dr. Prickett and Professor Wong, how long do we have to use biologic? How long? <laughs> Very good question. As <laughs> what I've said in in the uh, on the slide is actually, you know, you know, th those who make biologics are very smart. Now we have to ask the fundamental question: Why would that patient have severe asthma? And of course, the underlying reason varies from patient to patient. And but there must be a group of factors that makes someone very severe. And now you started your biologic and the patient improved. Mm -hmm. Let's say 
over a six month period, the patient became much, much better. And you start asking yourself, you know, when can I wean it off or wean down the biologic? So the question is, if the biologic, let's say, has no long-term modifying effect. So one would expect when you wean down the biologic, the patient get worse again. And try to also look at from the patient's point of view. Let's say if someone has been poorly controlled for so long, and now you got the patient on biologic and see dramatic improvement. Now, if cost is not a big factor, would you like to win off the drug as much as possible? Because you are enjoying the, the good control, you know, after six months. So I think you know, we, we, we need a few very good trials to just like steroid, you know, steroid reduction type of protocol. So after six months of well control, let's wean down the biologic stepwise and see what happened to the patient. And we may be able to identify certain characteristics that predict someone may be successful in weaning off and someone will need to continue for the medication for a long period of time. But one good thing about severe asthma, even in the adolescent though, is a lot of the so-called severe ones, they improve with time. So it's likely that we have more success in weaning off a lot of treatment in the younger age group as opposed to the older age group. Okay, Ka. Professor Paquet, do you have anything to add on that question? How long should we use the biologic? Oh, just like Gary said, um, you know, as long as the cost is not a major concern. And also, um, I, I feel that, you know, a disease can get better uh, once we take good care of the patients. And, you know, once the patient uh, is better, um, just like a, with Gina, you have to step down. Uh, and biologic is one of them that uh, has to be considered. I, I think it's some of the disease that uh, difficult to treat, for instance, like chronic rhinitis with polyps, there's a chance that you, you cannot uh, wean them off. But atopic dermatitis or asthma, I think it, it, it is possible, yes. Okay, Khan. So I would like to thank all the speaker for this session, um, Dr. Arapan, Dr. Pagit, and Professor Gary Wong Khan. Thank you very much for your insightful speech on asthma.